subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. If you were to look at that, I grew up and you did too because we're just a year apart. We grew up in a scarcity economy. We grew up in an economy where if you wanted to take a train ticket, it helped to be given access to a quota or you had to buy it in the black market. A pair of Levi's jeans was a very desirable product. We are now in an economy where we get everything, where there isn't necessarily a scarcity. We're in an economy that has plenty. We are also, I think, witnessing the biggest growth of the middle class since India's independence. These are effectively Manmohan Singh's children, people who post the 1991 economic reforms have been pushed into the middle class from backgrounds that weren't necessarily middle class. And therefore, don't share the assumptions and the views or the values of the old middle class. In many ways, resent the old middle class, resent what it represents. And that leads to a certain amount of social tension, which you see most clearly on social media. It's not talked about in terms of we are the new middle class and you are the old middle class who let India down. But when people talk about the Luchans elite or they talk about people who speak English well, that's what the battle is about. And that battle plays itself out in politics, on social media, in media and in conversations in our homes. And the most fascinating thing yet is uh, I'm interested that you describe them as Manmohan Singh's children. Mm -hmm. That Manmohan Singh's children who, who've been made Tens of crores of them who've been made enormously more wealthy than they were or enormously less poor than they were, no longer vote for Manmohan Singh or, or his party or any party that like the, that. I really mean that Manmohan Singh and liberalization created this new generation, this new class that then went straight for Mr. Modi and became his strongest supporters and now have nothing but contempt for Manmohan Singh and what he represented. So what has caused that to happen? Oh, I think many reasons, Shekhar. One of them, some of them, and I, I, you must understand, I speak as a member of the old middle class, so obviously my perspective is slightly biased. To some, el some element of it is the old middle class, lauded it over the new middle class for reasons that are frankly ridiculous. We speak better English, we do this, we do that. And I think the new middle class is right to resent the old middle class for bragging about its command of English. I mean, why should any Indian be judged on the way he speaks English, to be for bragging about how they went to school or how they went to college. Does it matter if you went to Doon School or St. Stephen's? It shouldn't matter in any proper egalitarian society. So the old middle class in many ways, I think, sowed the seeds of its own destruction. But the new middle class also feels, I think, slightly awkward because they didn't go to these schools, because they didn't have, don't speak English necessarily as well. And they feel now that unlike the old days when the upper middle class dominated discourse, social media has now given others in the middle class, not necessarily the top end of the middle class, an equal voice. When you're on Twitter, when I tweet, you tweet, or some 18-year-old in Bilaspur who's just become part of the middle class tweets, the three tweets appear together. It seems like we have an equal voice. So I think in many ways, the resentments that the new middle class has are genuine. I think the old middle class asked for it. But I also think that these resentments, resentments now are carried too far because they start questioning everything that went in the past. They start questioning the values of the old, what they say are the old middle class, such as secularism, for instance. They find it necessary to knock Nehru because they see him as a hero of an older kind of India. It'll pass. I mean, it's a demographic thing. When the children of this generation come of age, it'll pass. But at the moment, because of the economic ferment, we are a society with many fault lines. But compare this with, say, the BJP. BJP, yeah. at least at the top, is not run by any dynasts right now. So India, Indian politics has this other strand also. Narendra Modi, single. Right? RSS chief, in any case, single. Mamta Banerjee, the most powerful opposition leader, single. Yogi Adityanath, the most powerful BJP leader outside of Delhi, single. Uh, and then you can go across the country and you find many more of these. Uh, Nitish Kumar, uh, single. So yeah. there is that side also. So these are two fascinating, conflicting streams. I actually think the second stream, the 
not the single stream is in many ways a reaction to the contempt people have for politicians who get into politics, win the confidence of people, and then begin to teach it, treat it like a family business. One of the things Mr. Modi has going for him is that there is no sense of entitlement. He makes much of the fact that he came from a poor background. He does not have a fancy education, though apparently he has a degree in entire political science, but not from a very fancy university. And he spent his time as an RSS worker, not getting any, any privilege or anything. So he's seen as a guy who got there himself and who has no reason to enrich himself. Who will he leave that money to? Which son will he promote? Which daughter will he get married? I think that's a very powerful part of Mr. Modi's appeal, his personal appeal, which the Congress ignores. Why has the Congress never understood it? Because if you talk to senior Congress people, and I'm now fed up of listening to them talking about only one thing, that there is no nothing. Mr. Modi is not getting any votes because we are unpopular. He's only getting the votes because of EVMs. And this is some of the senior most Congress people who seem to genuinely believe this. I think it's a general problem with the Congress because you get uh, Congress leaders who talk about EVMs ad nauseum. Others who talk about, and I suppose the group of 23 would be an example, who talk about how they've been frozen out, how the party's going down the wrong path, yet there's nothing they can do about it. And then you have, and that's, I think, never happened before in the Congress. Perhaps it happened in the Indira Gandhi era and we didn't see it. You have around Rahul Gandhi, what is not a political party, but it's a cult. These yeah. are people who support Rahul Gandhi, right or wrong, not necessarily because of any ideology, but they've become like fans. These, If you look at, say, the BJP's IT cell and you look at the tweets that come out, you can tell which is a two rupee wala, where it's come from. But in the case of the Congress, many of these people who tweet abuse at you, at me, at all of us who dare to suggest that Rahul Gandhi does not walk on water are actually cultists. It's like Jim Jones of Jonestown, the suggestion that... How can you suggest our leader is human? He is perfect. If you are suggesting that the Congress is false, that uh, Rahul Gandhi was not born in a manger in Bethlehem, this means you're a Modi lover. This means that you're a communalist. It's never, as far as I know, or at least I can remember, happened with the Congress before. There have been people who've been loyal to leaders, but they've been open to their faults. They've been broadly visioned enough to see what is happening. But no, you now have around Rahul Gandhi, a cult of people who are blind loyalists with tunnel vision. Young of today are ambitious, adventurous, willing to experiment, vibrant and self-confident than we were 30 years back, right? Uh, we were stayed, complacent, easily settled. Uh, we often thought of ourselves as not good enough and were extremely diffident in putting across any point of view, uh, even when abroad. What do you think made this change to happen? And also, let me add to that, do you think we become too sure of ourselves now? I don't know about too sure, but I mean, we talked about this earlier. I think 1991 was the turning point, not just in terms of reforms, but in terms of technology. Until that point, till the 1990s, if anything said made in India, that meant it was a second rate or a third rate product. The software companies, the enforcers of the world, suddenly made India a force to reckon with. The term Bangalore and Bangalore enter, entered the vocabulary. There was a sense in which India became a player on the world stage. I think that had a lot to do with our confidence. Many other things happened. We began traveling more, people saw more of us, more middle-class Indians went abroad than before. We went and saw it and we said, hey, it's not that different. We're not necessarily much worse off. I'll give you my own example. When I went to school in England, I'd finished school in India and I went to school in England in 1973 because in England, you have to do two more years before you can join university. And this sounds terrible to say in retrospect, but I remember thinking at the end of my first term, hey, you know, we're better than these guys. Our educational system teaches us much more. I know much more than these guys do. And that happened, say, in the English papers. I was always feeling that, you know, I've come from India. How will I do in an English public school, an English paper? I actually topped the school. I think there was a sense in which we didn't realize how good we were. So there is Deepak Mehta from Uja Enterprises, our subscriber, 
who asks you a trick question and actually he helps uh, my cause because i thought we spent too much time talking about the congress so he's bringing us to the bjp okay. and his question his question is a simple one why is veer sangvi very critical of the bjp can he not present his views as a neutral person no i don't think there is anybody who is neutral when it comes to politics you may be neutral when it comes to party politics it's fair to say don't be a congress person don't be a bjp person you're a journalist but i don't think it's fair to say don't have any core values don't have any core beliefs if you don't have any core beliefs then you shouldn't be a citizen let alone a journalist i have core beliefs my core belief is that india was created as an idea as a state which was not based on religion as a state where caste didn't matter where religion didn't matter where everybody is equal and i believe that unless you follow that principle india is in danger it's not a question of hindus being good to muslims or whatever you can't have between 12 to 15% of your population alienated no country can survive that way shekhar in fact had a very good piece making that point a month ago so yeah those are my core beliefs and when i hear aditya yogi adityanath and various people say things that i personally find appalling i am going to oppose them if yogi adityanath had been a congressman and had said the same thing i would oppose him just as much and if you heard shekhar me talking today we're not particularly great fans of the congress i think journalists ultimately should be fans of nobody but journalists like all citizens must have core beliefs because if you don't have core values you are nothing shibu kumar das retired banker having been largely a product of print journalism how do you see its future visibly digital look print journalism is in trouble all over the world i don't think india can be an exception to that trend people are moving away from print in everything even in offices once upon a time you would have sheets of paper on every desk now people just look at their screens so newspapers cannot be an exception to that trend nor can magazines print journalism is on a downward spiral but i'll make two points well one point really which is that journalism has survived if you look at the new york times and you look at papers abroad and in many countries they've shifted to the net they make money they have pay sites people are willing to pay for them so journalism is not really dead it's just gone to your phone however i think old style print journalism is in particular danger in india because of the way in which we redefine journalism from the 80s and the 1990s journalism all over the world is a mixture of subscription was paid for by a mixture of subscription revenue and advertising revenue because if you were to just go by the price of a newspaper it wouldn't cover even the cost of paper so advertisers subsidized it what happened in india was we started giving our newspapers away at low prices sometimes even for free looking for huge circulations once we got the huge circulations we went to advertisers advertisers gave us ads so various things happened as a consequence one of which was that for new many major newspapers in india advertisers became the focus readers were only a by product a means of getting to the advertiser but more significantly what this meant was that indians began to believe you shouldn't pay for news saurav tambi uh, from uh, au small finance bank who says the media has undergone a drastic badlav mera media badal gaya hai with digital media taking over do you think it is the way forward how difficult is it will it be for digital media to establish itself as a key source of information what kind of media so digital media yeah yeah i think so i think digital media will become the primary source of information for everyone it is i mean shekhar and i have talked about this there are challenges with digital media including the reluctance of indians to pay for news but there is also this obsession we have in india it's peculiarly indian obsession with large numbers with circulations we always saying that if something sells more it must be better which is why our newspapers destroyed themselves in the circulation wars by chasing bogus abc circulations by copying by buying copies and selling them as a ratti shaker will tell you how bad it was i think some of us are making the same mistake with digital media shaker talked about snakes marrying trees etc there is now a tendency because we want these big numbers to do click bait type stories so all too often the big platform digital media 
newspaper houses that have gone on to them and houses have become trivial catering to the lowest common denominator operations. It's oddly enough, the newer operations people like the print who I've mentioned before, and many others who've shown that there is new ground, there's a new way of doing things. It isn't that you have to marry snakes off to trees or carry photographs of starlets and bikinis in the lagoon to get lots and lots of clicks or views. You have to appeal to people's slightly less base instinct through our higher instincts. I think digital media will make that journey in India. It's made it elsewhere. We can't be an exception, but I think it'll take a little time. All the people you've met, yeah. and let's, let's talk politics for a moment. The three most interesting political moments that you experienced, where you were personally involved. It can well, be a conversation, it can be an observation, it may, can be a coincidence. I'm trying to think. I think the first time I met Rajiv Gandhi, which was the first time in my life I had met a prime minister, and this was Rajiv Gandhi at the height of his powers when he had a two-thirds majority in parliament. And I remember shaking when I went into his cabin on the on the prime minister's aeroplane, talked to him. It was a big moment in my life. I think the moment when I realized that Sonia Gandhi was not going to take the prime ministership and that Manmohan Singh was going to take it. And I spoke to Manmohan Singh about it. I think that was a big moment in my life because I had that sense of being slightly ahead of the curve. And I'm trying to think of a third one. Uh, possibly the election of Narendra Modi. I was on television commenting on the elections on India Today as it was when it happened. And I said then, I, in fact, I called the election before we was ready to call it. And I said then, everybody thought I was joking, that this was not a change of guard. It was not a new prime minister. It was the beginning of a revolution that would upend many things and turn over many of our assumptions about the kind of country India was. Not necessarily in a good way, but sometimes in a good way, but not necessarily so. I think that's the moment I'll always remember. Is news television past its week? Yeah, yeah, it's completely past its week. I imagine that ultimately the future will be platforms like this one, which are a mixture of visual and of print. And therefore, people will be able to get access to video footage and read articles. The idea that you read a newspaper, you watch a television channel is very much a 20th century idea. I don't think it'll survive for very long into the 21st century. And for that reason, if for no other reason, I think print, I think print is dying and broadcast television is on its way out. On the other question, what would be my advice to young journalists? Well, just that life is very different. When Shekhar started, when I started, we could go and talk to politicians and we were young, both of us were very young when we started, but they would treat us with respect. They would talk to us, they would open up, they would tell us things. You often learned as journalists, things that were about to happen. You understood the people who made those decisions because they would open up to you, they would talk to you. They weren't necessarily people you approved of. I mean, I disagreed very profoundly with Bal Thakare's politics, but though I was what, 23, he would call me home for dinner. He would talk about what he believed in. He would treat me with respect. That era is dead. And I think we are very lucky, Shekhar and I, that we started in that era. You now, if you're dealing with this government, People are so frightened that most people will think twice before meeting you unless they're sure you're on the approved list. Nobody at the top will give you any inside information, even if they give you any access. So it's much more difficult now being a political journalist when, than it was when we started because you're, you face a brick wall. You have politicians and governments that control enough of the allegedly free or independent media to not necessarily care what you write. And you have vindictive politicians who, when you write things they don't approve of, will call your bosses or your employers. So in that sense, political journalism is a high-risk enterprise now <clears throat> compared to when I started out. On the other hand, it's also a more challenging enterprise. If you can still do it, if you can still find out what's happening, if you can still write stories that make a difference, well, then you're a better man or a woman than either, either, either of us when we started out in those easier days. 